so as I mentioned to you just a short while ago, we're really trying to figure out exactly how it is we go from the conversation and what we wish to do to exactly the action so that we can have delivery. I mentioned we've got Evie Hamro, who's the global head of thematic and sector investing at BlackRock. He joins us online. Welcome to you. I'm going to get straight off the bat speaking with you, Your Excellency, if you don't mind my doing so. I would like to get a sense of your view around exactly what some of the learnings have been from the environments that we're in now. For example, Saudi Arabia, when it comes to transforming mining, what can we take from their story thus far? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Um, thank and, you very uh, much. Let me start by thanking everybody being here today. And sorry for the delay. We had uh, a clutch. Thank you very much for being uh, around in, in the future Mino Forum that is, the, is growing from a year to year in, uh, in a double last years. For transformation, uh, Tommy, to happen, they, it, it requires more than mining, but for government to be transformed, it requires leadership, vision, uh, a plan, and uh, uh, commitment and a will from the top and persistence for the change. And in Saudi Arabia, we have all this in His Royal Highness, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is the leader of the vision, who have made the plan, and he is continuously following up on, uh, through the center of government. In addition to this, of course, you need a good strategy. That's what we have developed, benchmark the world, uh, brought the best minds, learned from history, learned from mistakes, learned from successes, and we develop a, 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 a strategy that that deliver for the for the main stakeholders, the society around the communities, the economy, and of course the the investors. For investors to come, the focus is always the five main factors that any investor in mining would look geology, security of tunnel, the stability of a policy, and uh, uh, of course, profitability of operation, in addition to availability of infrastructure. So we have ma marched on all this, and we have delivered mostly all of them. Geology, we cannot change what's in ground, but we developed our, uh, we put our 80 years of, of knowledge and information of reports of survey into a national geological database and, for, and we opened it for a free, easy access on a digital platform. On, uh, we are, in addition, we are doing the world's most ambitious regional geological survey that will cover this Arabian Shield, which is around 700,000 kilometers, geophysics, geochemical, and mapping. It will cost more than it, 700 to 800 million dollars, and it, we will finish it in a record time in 2025. But by today, we are two years into it. When whatever information we get, we will put. We are we're going to put it in the National Geological uh, Database. On infrastructure, Saudi Arabia has, has the best infrastructure around the world, the best roads, the best electricity network. But more than that. We are investing in Saudi Arabia more than $160 billion in the coming five years to build roads, ports, railroads, so we can serve investors in, in the mining, but also in the other sectors. This is a big undertaking. Security of tenor, policy stability. We had issued our investment law. We learned from everywhere, South Africa, the main law firm was was among them a South African, and also from Canada and Australia. We learned, and we uh, developed one of the best, latest, the, the world latest, but one of the best, or the best law around the world for investments that provide for security of tenor, clarity, transparency, low uh, administrative discretion, and uh, ensure that uh, investors have a license and have it for good without any change, but with their permission. And the profitability, 
we made sure the fiscal part of, of our uh, mining investment law is the lowest in the world. There is nowhere in the world the maximum income tax the max and mineral rights is only 25% at a cap of the net profits. This is, this is competitive. So these are the three main factors and we delivered on them. Yeah. And I think what's, what's interesting is that it's really a holistic approach, right? So it's not just one thing or doing one thing at a time. It's how do you get all these moving pieces to work together uh, in a dance, <laughs> if you will. Uh, Evie, if I could come to you online, you're the global head of thematic and sector investing, which means that you're really focusing on, on where is a good place to do activity and how do you make sure that that environment remains conducive for you to, to, to continue continue uh, investing in that space. The minister has just given us a sense of, from a Saudi Arabian perspective, what it is that they believe they need to be doing to help in delivering that intent into action. What do you see as the imperatives that are needed to do so? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me um, uh, at the event, and I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, it was fascinating to hear those previous comments. Um, and I, I totally agree with, with them. For us as investors, we are always looking for a number of things. As the minister said, um, starting off with geology, uh, and I'm really excited to hear about all of the plans to um, do the work to showcase what yeah, is potentially in the ground. I think that the second thing is stability. Um, we have seen far too many incidences where capital that is taking the risk uh, around the development of projects um, the rules of the game get changed um, part of the way through uh, the return cycle for the people who've taken the risk. Uh, I know that the, in some cases there are extenuating circumstances which trigger um, these rule changes, but for investors, stability uh, around that is absolutely imperative. Um, and if there is stability, obviously the cost of capital uh, will be much lower. Uh, and, and that's obviously beneficial for ongoing development and further financial support um, of, of the industry. So for us, that's a, an essential one. And the third one is obviously everything to do with the environment and, and ESG. Um, for us, um, that's an absolute imperative with regards to the investments that we're making today. But I think also um, for the industry as a whole, um, it needs to think more about not just the quality of the product, it is producing, but how the product has been produced. Uh, and I think that many customers will be spending more time looking at this in the future uh, with regards to how they use those products and how they've been supplied uh, and the impact that has on the end product that they are then creating for their customers. And so that's the third thing that, uh, that we look for. Evie, I, I know that you have to go, which is a pity because we'd love to have you join us for the rest of the conversation, but we certainly have taken your points on board and uh, hopefully we'll have opportunity on another occasion to elaborate a little bit more. But perhaps, uh, uh, Dr. Al Sagaf, if I can come to you, clearly in order for us to do any of those things, I mean, the, minute, the, the, the Vice Minister was speaking a few minutes ago and a lot of what he was saying had to do with a certain type of expertise that would be required in order to deliver the goods. Can you share a little bit about what needs to, done from an educate, needs to be done from an education sector to ensure that we have the skills? Because if we're looking at the kind of growth that everybody's talking about over the next few years, currently we don't have the skills. Well, uh, thank you very much. Yes, and uh, I would like to even amplify what uh, His Excellency said even further and be maybe perhaps a little bit contrarian. And I would like to say that we talked a lot today about investment in the mining sector. And uh, we need to ask ourselves, what does it take to create and launch and nourish a sector? And it is everybody's view, you just stated it, that it needs investment and it needs talent. However, the mistake that we sometimes make is that we assume that it needs investment and talent, and therefore, the operator between them is a plus, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a mathematician, so I worry about these things. <laughs> and I say, no, 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 no. The operator between them is not a plus, because if it is a plus, it means you can make up for the lack of talent with additional investment, which is not the case. In fact, the operator between them is a multiplication. <laughs> it is the talent 
who amplify that investment and bring it to fruition and enable it and make it uh, a possibility to uh, create and launch and nourish that sector. And if you put a lot of investment and the talent is zero, you multiply by a zero and you get nothing. And this, in the same manner, if you have a lot of talent but no investment, you also get no sector because that talent just seeps away and migrates to other countries and so on and so forth. So I'd like to emphasize that it is a multiplication, the role of academic institutions such as uh, King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals is to create that talent. Uh, this is what the university did for the oil and gas sector. It created that talent for Saudi Aramco and now most of the engineers in Saudi Aramco, the CEO, all of his deputies, the top leadership are, are all alums. Uh, of uh, KFUBM, and that is exactly the intent, and that fact did not escape His Excellency, himself a distinguished alum of KFUBM and his team, and this is why we signed today an MOU to do many things. Uh, amongst them is to create a new uh, undergraduate degree in integrated uh, mining science and engineering, which would not only integrate mining science and engineering, covering everything from statics and rock mechanics to engineering of mines and mine surveys and safety and valuation and so on, but will inject a heavy dose of artificial intelligence, uh, computing and simulation and so on and so forth. And I am sure it will be the envy of uh, programs everywhere. The university is already number 18 worldwide in mining, but it is through research. We don't have currently an active program. And that program, I believe, is going to be the seed that would really enable this sector uh, to flourish and, and, in fact, become a premier sector in the kingdom, just like the oil and gas sector has become. It's interesting that you're speaking about this additional investment in education programs, which supports specifically the mining sector. We've heard about that a little bit earlier in, in the day and how important it is to rethink how we're educating to rethink how we learn. And, and perhaps, Mark, if I can come to you, that rethinking isn't just restricted to the process or restricted to how we teach. What is it else that we need to be thinking differently when we're trying to turn intent into action for a future that we're not even sure what it looks like yet? So firstly, it's great to be here. It's a fantastic event. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to build on, I love the multiplication analogy. I'm also a mathematician. I think the multiplication is absolutely correct. Um, I'll actually say we, we actually need to build beyond those technical skills. The, the actual, many of the constraints that we face when we're developing you know, a new mine or new mining operations are actually our interrelationships with our communities, with our governments, our partnerships. And we need to build those skill sets as well. So and I think it's real innovation. Yeah, we need the technical skill sets, which are scarce in many parts of the world. And, and an opportunity to build those is, is fantastic. But we also need to build that ability to work in partnership, to really listen, to work with our communities, to work with our governments, and to find win-win solutions. And that's a different skill set. It's a different form of innovation. Different, definitely different form of innovation. Um, but it can also be a tricky thing to do, right? Because we're not exactly always sure. Uh, Benedict, if I, if I can come to you, we need to do things differently. That is the bottom line. We've heard that for, you know, today. We've heard that in other events. We're hearing that all over the world. We need to think differently. We need to do differently. What does differently look like? I guess before you think about doing something differently, I think you first have to start doing something. And uh, that's where typically projects stop, right? The idea is great. So the why is great. Everyone understands it's important. We need more minerals, green energy transition. We've heard this a thousand times during this conference. The what is pretty clear. We know what we're going to need to mine and how much. But the how is not clear. And I think that's the real challenge is how do you actually now deploy the capital, the resources, the intelligence, the technology? How do we deploy? And um, I mean, there's, this is a team sport, right? This is not like football where Messi and Mbappé decide the game. Here, we actually need all 22 players. Don't talk about that. That's together. a very painful <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Find other analogies, uh, Bennett. But it's a team sport. You probably agree it's a team sport. And uh, to give you an idea of what, um, what we've done here in, in Saudi Arabia, I think Saudi Arabia is, has, what's, when the kingdom applies its mind and its resources to a plan, I think it, it is impossible to beat it in its ability for execution. Right? And what we've seen here is, uh, is we've, we, two years ago, we opened offices in Riyadh and in, uh, in Jeddah. 
We applied for large exploration areas, which we've been partially granted, and we're very proud of that. I think there's great potential in those. Um, we've hired local people. We found fantastic employees, and honestly speaking, we found particularly some very talented women in this country, very engaged, very proactive, very well educated, very hard working in general. I think that the work ethic here is very exceptional. Uh, but now we have to go and deploy. And the deployment will mean we'll have to um, cover very large areas of land. This has never been done before. There's many government agencies that have a say in our ability to go and deploy the money. This is not a capital allocation problem, I mean, there's enough money, right? This is about getting the money on the road. And getting the money on the road, you'll have to go and deploy technology across large areas. For example, one thing we've done is here, we're going to pilot this year a, a revolutionary uh, remote operating vehicle fleet that will do grab samples on these large areas. This will be a first for Saudi Arabia, probably be a first for most other geographies as well. It's called Gudelius. We're very excited about it, which will dramatically reduce the time for sampling large areas of land, which is exactly what we need here to get, uh, to get the reflection on the, uh, on the, on the metallurgy. So it's, um, this is a place where you cannot just have the resources to deploy, but I think we've also got an environment which is very supportive mm. and open for new technology, which allows the kingdom, I think, to, to, to leapfrog some of the things that have been done in other countries. And we know, I mean, developing businesses in mining is very hard. I mean, we built, we went from zero tons of cobalt, we're now one of the largest cobalt producers for better materials, we went from zero tons of cobalt to 26,000 tons this year, right? That's enough to, about, to make about four million electric vehicles. It's by far not enough, but the execution challenge to go from zero to 26 is, huge. is, is tremendous, yeah, is tremendous. Yeah. And not just money, a lot of things have to come together. This is a team sport. And uh, what I've seen here in the kingdom, um, and uh, Mr. Al Modafer is a, a perfect example of this. Is, this is an, an ecosystem environment that wants to help investors succeed, and we're very appreciative of that. Your Excellency, if I, if I can come back to you, and then perhaps, Mark, I'd like to chat to you a little bit about the innovation question. So to both of you, it's going to be a similar one. But I think the question when people are looking about Saudi Arabia, I'm going to use myself as an example. So I was invited to come to Saudi Arabia a few months ago, and I thought, OK, this is going to be interesting, because we all read the news, and we all see what's in the news about Saudi Arabia does this and does this. I was literally taken aback when I arrived, not just in terms of what I found, but in terms of the thinking and the attempts and the commitment that the leadership of this country has put in terms of reaching either 2030 or net zero 2060, you know, pick whichever one is your favorite, but the commitment remains the same. But what it has also meant is exactly what Benedict is speaking of, not being afraid of thinking differently and that innovation of thought being applied across the board. When it comes to teaching other parts of the world how they can themselves be turning this intent into action, surely thinking differently is a key component of that. Innovative thinking. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. That's, that's a great uh, perspective on, on, uh, on, on what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is now on the vision, is beyond the inflection point. So the delivery is there, and the leadership will for transforming Saudi Arabia is the difference. And this is a very important point. You, you have mentioned it, and it's clear. Without that vision and will, we will not be here by now. The second one is, is, is being uh, marching in the land. The, the, the objective is to have an ambitious nation, a thriving economy, and a vibrant society. An ambitious nation has to do something, has to do different, has to deliver in different. Neom, Neom the, uh, the Neom projects, the projects, uh, also the national industrial strategy, the national investment strategy are all ambitious. And if, every time we have an ambitious, and we, th we think it's in, we are ambitious, there is more to do. On the other side, it's very important to gain trust. Trust by delivering. And, and this is really where the difference that is there, and that's where the measurement of KBI and other is, is going on. So trust by, from investors, trust from communities, trust from society is, is a must thing, and that's what we have delivered on, or the kingdom has delivered on 
through the lead leadership and the, and the strategy and the vision in the last five, six years. And now we are building on the future to deliver even more. Yeah, I think it's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, if I can come to you, Mark, he's speaking about the importance of getting the community on board. I know some of the challenges that you have in some parts of the world in trying to bridge that particular gap in ensuring that the community comes along with the ride because there's a clear understanding that it's to everyone's benefit if that happens in many instances. Absolutely. And I mean, and I think that comes down to that partnership. It really comes down to how do you actually work with the community, work with your governments for a win-win? Um, and if we don't bring that, um, then, then that is what actually slows us down most of the time. And I think you know, that the innovation, you can tie that to the innovation as well. It's how do we actually mine better? How do we actually have less impact? How do we actually extract more minerals from the ore bodies? How do we actually extract minerals from the tailings? How do we, yeah, and, and we're doing that in, in our operations in Canada and in the US. Yeah, selenium, tellurium, stuff that we were throwing away. We need to do more of that. And I think you know, one of the great things that, that the kingdom can do is apply the, the, that sort of innovation that they've had in the hydrocarbon industry to this industry. And, and there's so many breakthroughs that happen when you take technology from one sector and you look at it and you apply it in, in a different sector. But that combination of history and in, of innovation and ambition um, is really going to make a big difference. When we're speaking about that, Dr. Al Sagaf, if I can come to you, when we're speaking about the community aspect um, and again the, the innovation question, what role is it that education institutions, as part of the community, right, because they're an extension of, of that space, what role can they play and how can they play that role in ensuring that they're supporting the region's ambitions and the initiatives that are being grown in the region more actively and more deliberately so that we are sure that what the institutions are producing is talent that can actually be absorbed by the industries in the region? Yeah, I have a small follow-up to the previous question, if, if you oh, like. Oh, please, go say. ahead. Um, I believe it's if the community is to be expected to embrace companies who come to their house, to their area, the companies must be em empathetic. They must really show, show concern and respect yeah. for those communities. I think this is something that Saudi Arabia in particular has learned very, very well. When, Saudi, when uh, Aramco came to the kingdom, it started by embracing the community. It uh, taught uh, uh, the uh, students uh, of the community. It launched the first railroad in the kingdom, the first TV, the so on. And so the community saw it as a source of richness to the community rather than somebody who is just harvesting. That they saw it as a seed planting rather than a harvesting. And that is very important. It is not always seen around the globe. We see all uh, sorts of problems in Nigeria and others where the community feels that companies came to extract and take away their wealth rather than share it. And so it is very, very important, I think, that, that every stakeholder is seen by the community as someone or an entity that seeds future growth and future um, uh, prosperity. And uh, that is very important for the embrace of the community to the investors. For the role of uh, academia and the types of uh, graduates, I think uh, there are three types of uh, output of any academic institution. Any, I don't mean our university, any academic institution. And by output, I mean graduates. The first type are the economy burdening output. Those are the graduates that are not needed in today's or future economy. And so what are you going to do with them? They just increase unemployment. After studying for four and a half or five years, they take uh, menial jobs that are uh, not commensurate with their studies. And so on. and they become a source of worry, even political unrest in some countries and so on and so forth. The second uh, type, which is the bulk of any economy, the largest part, are the economy maintaining uh, graduates. Those are the ones like the employees of Sabic and Aramco and the bankers and the electricity company and so on who maintain the current economy and make sure that it continues to grow and to thrive and so on and so forth. The last and third part 
are the economy creating graduates, the economy creating output. Those are the ones who actually create new sectors like mining and others. And this is where the niche of KFUBM is. This is what we tell our uh, students. We tell them we are a small university. You as a student, you are not here to learn for a job. You are here to create a job. And this is exactly what I think is needed by academic institutions. In order to create this third output, it doesn't only depend on who you get, which is very important because the better the intake is, usually the better the, the output is, but also what you do with them. Uh, at KFUBM, for example, since we started transforming the university, we insisted that everybody uh, at the university will be fluent in artificial intelligence. We created a platform we called AI plus X that you first learn AI and then you learn mining or petroleum or mechanical or finance and so on and so forth through courses in advanced Python, AI and machine learning, big data and data analytics, entrepreneurship and business and so on and so forth. So we created 40 different subspecialties that aim to create the future sectors. Things like hydrogen mobility, uh, quantum computing, non-metallic materials, and so on and so forth, to ensure that our graduates are the, at the third type, the ones who are needed for the future economy, the ones who are going to create these sectors. And you see some universities now, and some companies talk about quantum computing and so on, as it's some a dream. So, so if I can just come in there, because what I'd like to get a better sense of is what that nexus is, or where is that moment where institutions are then better able to coordinate and cooperate with businesses that are going to absorb this, pal this talent? Because it's all good and well for you to be doing what you're doing, but if the business isn't doing better about creating spaces that are receptive to using that talent, you run the risk of some of that talent going to waste. Absolutely. Or that talent does not specialize in the things that are needed to create the new sectors. Yeah. And, and herein lies the Achilles heel of being at the forefront of teaching new things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if I tell you that I like you as an electrical engineer to specialize in bioelectronics and sensors, and this is the future of the kingdom, we want to create the biotech, we want to get into things like manufacturing of artificial limbs and artificial hearts and genetics and so on and so forth. You will tell me, oh, Dr. Mohammed, what, what is, what, show me the job. <laughs> and I'll say, well, well, the job is going to be there. You just need to trust me. And students are very pragmatic. They, they don't trust their <laughs> university <laughs> presidents. And at the same time, when we talk to companies and tell them you need to come here, they tell us, okay, where is the talent? This is not oil and gas. You are not just going to give me cheap feedstock. We need the talent. And hence comes this catch 22. The companies need the talent. The talent does not want to get into that sector because they don't see the jobs. And so it's a vicious circle. And therefore, um, we need a better coordination and uh, coordination and linkage with, uh, with we created at KFUBM some, something called SEED, the uh, Student Early Employment and Development, where you come to the university before graduation and say, I like these students. I'm going to take him and promise him a job if he goes into that sector, and hence we can bootstrap this process. You know, bootstrapping is very important to start any process. In, in cars in the old days, you need to manually crank it. Now there is a crankshaft that is electric and so on. It, no machine in the world starts without cranking, and this is our attempt to uh, crank this process in order to indeed uh, circumvent this vicious circle. Yeah. If I can come to you, uh, Benedict, you spoke a little bit earlier about women uh, and what you had seen in Saudi Arabia in terms of your organization's experience. The truth of the matter is that we can have engineers, we can have uh, uh, scientists, and those we need. But the reality is that business today needs a whole community. It's a whole ecosystem of different people with different skill sets, with different points of view and different perspectives, i.e. diversity. Creating the future that we want and turning that intent into action, what is it that we need to do differently about ensuring that we have more diverse employees, teams, leadership within the business world without necessarily leaving it to those communities or the women to tell us what the answer is? How do we create a conducive environment? 
I, I find the, uh, the, the much talked about talent shortage, I, I find it, there's too much talk about it and not enough doing about it. Because mining is a, a, a very attractive career path for anyone that leaves school. And it doesn't have to be that somebody is fully trained when he joins the mining company. I mean, we do a lot of in-house training of people that literally finish school. We have people that now work in the third generation in our company. Right? We had the first people working in the 1940s, then in the 1980s, and now in the 2000s. So this is a, not a job, right? This is a profession for the long term, which means you can start as a, as a junior financial analyst, and you may end up as a, as a quantum computing artificial intelligence analyst in the exploration side. So, it's, so the, the job opportunities that are very long term are available. So it's, we don't actually find such an issue in identifying the right, the right individuals, and I think um, particularly here, where, where there's such a large, young workforce. Actually, the workforce here of under 30-year-olds is bigger than in Germany. My, my country is Germany, so you fast forward 50 years, and there'll be more Saudis than Germans. Right? It's a very easy calculation. There'll be more engineers in Saudi than in Germany, or in France, or in Spain, or in the UK for that matter. So it's, if you fast forward, we're in a long-term business. This is a 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 80-year business. Um, I see, I see the, the prospective opportunities here for individuals that go into mining as very positive. And one comment on the communities. There's an interesting statistic, I think from uh, probably ICMM, is the closer a person lives to a mine, the more positive he is about the mine. The further away people live from a mine, the more negative they are about mine. So it's all about perception and how immediate people feel the benefits. And this is something where, where here I think we're going to see great impact because mining is not just an investment, it's a multiplier. It's a multiplier. You typically want to 10, want to 20, whatever, depending on it is. You have a, for every dollar invested, there's 10 more dollars investment in infrastructure and in supplies, in, in electricity, in uh, railway, in road, in ports. So the multiplier, plus then all the technology aspect of this, and education and training and downstream beneficiation, which I think is the future for this region here, is to capture a large share of the midstream and downstream investments that will ultimately be necessary to process, refine, and make the products that are mined in the region here more valuable, they would have to be in this region here. Your response has got about three different conversations in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Benedict. But if I could narrow it down to one, what I would like to talk about is this view about young people. Because, you know, you talk about mining, everybody talks about mining being this long-term business, which it is. But we also know that with young people today, they want that agility. They want to be able to move. They want to be able to go here, and then I don't want to be too tied down. And granted, it's not everywhere, and it's not everyone. But the general trends, if, if you're looking at, at, at the research, is that a lot of young people want that ability. They want that maneuverability. How is the mining industry thinking about ensuring that you can still leverage off that talent and create that sense of mobility without necessarily necessarily losing that young talent, which you actually need for the next couple of decades. Yeah, we, we, we offer global mobility programs for our works. We've got about 100,000 people working around the world, in 20 countries. So if someone here is young and is excited to work in different places, please come and meet everyone <laughs> who's, who's willing to work in 20 different countries alone in his life. So it's, there's no question about mobility, and it's not just the mobility horizontally or geographically, but it's also the the vertical mobility. So coming from a very low level, you can move up very quickly, very high in, in an organization like ours, which is growing very fast and which opens new offices. We've opened four new countries in the last 12 months. So I don't think Amazon has actually done that in the last 12 months. Quite the opposite, this over, this incredibly hyped sector of IT and technology has only been shedding workers. Who has been hiring most of the workers is the oil industry, is the infrastructure industry, and is the mining industry. Right? They've probably hired more worker than the IT sector has laid off in the last year. So, <laughs> so we're, in a way, we're the new, we're the new <laughs> IT sector. I think we need to have a one-on-one -on -one fire chat with, with Benedict <laughs> with all his topics that he's throwing into this discussion. Okay, I want to come to you. One of the, the you know, in preparing for this um, and the innovation question, there seems to be a broad discussion within the mining sector about how a lot of this innovative thinking and newness is coming from looking at how we process things and how our processing, you know, is it in the tailings? Are we looking at extracting more reusable water from the tailings? Are we looking at extracting more critical minerals from the tailings? Are we looking at, you know, how can we get more money? Which 
to some extent has the question around efficiency, right? How do we better uh, uh, utilize what we extract? But what I found interesting when we had a quick uh, a chat backstage was that you said, that's not even the question. It's not even about the processing when we're looking about how the action is going to look in a couple of decades. We have to look beyond just the processing question mark. Yeah, so I think we need innovation across the entire you know, value chain. So we need innovation in exploration. Um, how do we use big data? We've, we've got to find a huge amount of resource in the next few decades. How do we use big data? How do we process the information that's coming off those drill rigs faster and instead of it taking three months for us to get assays back, making a decision on the fly and putting the next drill hole in a much better place? We've got to do it in processing. We've actually got to, there's all, all bodies that we know are there that are you know, contaminated with deleterious elements. How do we process those and extract that value? How do we do it in a much lower environmentally impactful way? Because that's what gives us our license to operate and our, our, our permitting. How do we actually create the, the right materials for our customers? What do our customers need in terms of innovative materials to solve their problems? And, and, and so we need innovation in that space. And we actually need innovation in, in where we close. We've got to close responsibly. To have a license to go and do the next thing, we have to have finished the last one well. And that is, you know, that is how do we look at the waste, you know, the, the, the wastewater coming off that closure? How do we extract the minerals from that and then use the water for the communities? How do we reprocess tailings? There are mining operations out there that are actually going to shut, not because they ran out of oil, but because they ran out of places to put tailings. And how do we use those tailings in a proactive way? And we've invested in some startups that are looking at how we use tailings for cement replacement and, and really extracting as much of the materials as we can, because you're right, it's actually it's an efficiency, it's a waste, it's a sustainability. Yeah, we've made a big impact on the environment. We should get the most we can from it, and we should, we should do that, you know, in consultation with our communities. Is, is the efficiency going to come? Uh, is, is it going to be uh, the expense that is paid in order to reach that sustainability, in order to ensure that ESG is complied with, that we have good governance, that the environment is taken care of, that the social elements are, are addressed? Or can the two coexist happily? I think you actually have to coexist. You know, it has to be that balance of we need to do this in an efficient way. We need to minimise their impact. We need to maximise the benefit for society. When you think about mining, you're, you're actually, your competitive advantage is the, the, the licence that that community gives you to extract that resource. And if you're not doing that in a, in a responsible, uh, efficient way and getting the most value, then, then, then you, you're not going to have that licence. Um, Excellency, ESG, when you speak to many members of leadership here in Saudi Arabia, ESG is a very real thing. Everybody's taking it pretty seriously, it would seem. Um, it's being built into the very nature of not just departments from a leadership government perspective, but from businesses. It's, it's a requirement, it's something that you're insisting. To what extent is that going to become the fabric of what needs to happen in the mining industry, not just the industry to make it sustainable, but when we're looking at future minerals and how we have to change the way we're going to deal with future minerals compared to how we've been doing mining in the past. Very good point. The future, the future uh, will be mineral intensive, and for it to be so, has, we have to do mining completely different of what we have been doing it in the past. And on the technology, we, we need, and, and today, and also in the education, and, and the, you, uh, half of our exhibition and, and half of the future mineral forum uh, uh, speeches is about technology. The other half is about ESG. Those are very important pillars for the future of, uh, of, of mining. For mining to continue and, 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 and be, it has to be sustainable, it has to be environmentally friendly, it has to contribute to society at, at large, the society and the host countries also. And it has to be governed well. But also technology have to be delivered because we have to deliver more from the existing operations and we have to discover new, new resources, but fast enough to, to, uh, to, to cover or to, sh to shorten the gap on the mismatch between demand and supply. The, 
when in Saudi Arabia, uh, environment is a very serious, we take environment very seriously. We, uh, the leadership, His Royal Highness is leading the Saudi Green Initiative, not only but for Saudi Arabia, but also the Middle East Green Initiative, initiative that will deliver plantation, protection of, of uh, lands. 30% of Saudi Arabia is going to be a reserve from maybe 3 or 2%, and more to protect the Red Sea, to make it also a place where, for, for the benefit of the Red, Red Sea countries. And in Saudi Arabia, we were lucky. We came late in mining. So we will benefit from all the experiences, and but also we'll do it all right. So our mining uh, law is a progressive. We use the best ESG. We consulted with ICMM and all the world, and we use the ACM, ICMM principle to be the law. We used all the, the cases around the world. We learned from investors, and we made and most of the investors in, 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 uh, in the Future Mineral Forum today have reviewed our mining law before it goes out. And of course, most of them are, sust uh, they put sustainability front and center, and therefore yeah, we have a progressive law at hand. And to go, uh, uh, an important message to conclude with is that for mining to make the future, minerals to be centered in the future, and we have to deliver, we have to be socially acceptable and environmentally friendly. Thank yeah. You. Okay, so this is my favorite. Oh, we've got three minutes. Goodness, <laughs> that was quick. Okay, this I would like to do really, really quickly. I'm going to start with uh, Benedict, and I'm going to work my way back. Two things that you think need to happen in order to ensure that intent is turned into action. In three, two, one, go Benedict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, the, the energy transition is, I like to call it, the biggest purchase order in history for the mining industry. And um, we've got an obligation to make it reality. And for this, we have to work together. So we have to collaborate and we have to be open to partnerships with other companies, with governments. This is not a single company trying to solve a single problem. This is a lot of different players that have to work together in a pre-competitive and a pre-political space to deploy the amount of capital that we need to deploy in the next 20 years. Was that two or one? Was that two or one? I can do another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm worried you're going to take another minute. Well, opportunity's lost. <laughs> can you give me two, Mark? So, so the two, and I would do partnership. I absolutely agree. Partnership, working with startups, working with more innovative, that's going to be essential. Working across, working with governments, communities, that's, that's key. I, I think the, the second one for me is actually the, our story. And we talked a lot about talent. And the, the way we're going to attract talent is if we've actually got a real purpose, that actually that talent sees the mining industry as part of the solution, as part of the, you know, solving the problem of the energy transition. So to me, that's the second one. We've actually got to really tell that story of how we contribute to society. Dr. Alex Zagaf, your two? Uh, I think number one, which I, I said it before, is that invest not only in the licenses and the factories and the lands and so on, invest in the talent because it is the true enabler of your success. Uh, success of the sector and success of individual investors and companies themselves. And number two, I view this as a long-term uh, investment in which you need to seed um, the investment and irrigate it and witness it uh, to grow. And then you can start thinking about harvesting it, although you might harvest even during the, the initial stages. But if you see this as an opportunity that you will prematurely harvest, it will not be beneficial. So it has to be seen with that long-term investment in mind. Excellency, the last word is yours. Yeah, so I, so I will have You're only... You're going to borrow some from him? Yeah, only oh, one. Okay. Trust. Trust from partners and countries in the region that we will continue the dialogue <laughs> and, and continue the, the dialogue and collaboration. Trust from investors that we will work hard to make our operation profitable, trust of communities that it will be safe and you will benefit and you will have your fair share and trust for the environment. We will never do mining if it's not environmentally uh, safe.
Thank you. Thank you so, so very much to all of you. That was such a pleasure. The time went really, really quickly. But uh, I'd love to thank you for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. Always a pleasure to see you, <laughs> Your Excellency. Gentlemen, thank you so very much.